Hello, everybody. My name is Ramona Handel Baima, and I am Chief Program Officer at Japan Society in New York City. Welcome to Concrete Paradise, Okinawan Brutalist Architecture. Um, first, uh, please allow me a moment to acknowledge those who have generously helped support this event. Um, it's presented as part of the US-Japan Dialogue, leveraging s and towards sustainability and resiliency program. It's made possible by a generous grant from the Toshiba International Foundation and is co-organized by our friends at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Foundation, Waste Foundation. We are also here because of additional support generously provided by an award from the National Endowment for the Arts. And thank you to the Talks Plus season sponsors, Mitsubishi UFJ Financial Group and Oryx Corporation USA, as well as an anonymous donor, the Sandy Heck Lecture Fund, as well as Helen and Kenneth A. Cowan. So this webinar explores the little known, but um, widely popular now, brutalist architecture on Okinawa as part of special programming commemorating the 50th anniversary year of Okinawa's return to Japanese sovereignty from the US occupation in 1972. This is the 50 year marker for that. Our speakers will also address the problems of concrete as a building material, considering sustainable strategies such as reuse and longevity, while also questioning its continued prevalence in building and associated environmental costs. Um, please allow me to uh, introduce our speakers, which I'm really excited about. First, we have Paul Tollett, an Okinawan-based photographer focused on brutalist architecture in Japan. Um, through his Instagram account, which I strongly recommend that you all sign up for immediately, um, at Brutal Zen, he aims to promote interest in this previously misunderstood style. He's interested in the origins and ongoing development of concrete use in Okinawa and sustainability issues surrounding this material. We're thrilled to have you, Paul. Thank you very We're, much, Ramona. Thank you. Thank you. We're also joined by Michael Kubo. Assistant Professor and Program Coordinator for Architectural History and Theory in the Gerald D. Hines College of Architecture and Design at the University of Houston. He's recently co-authored publications on the history of 20th century architecture and urbanism, including Imagining the Modern, Architecture and Urbanism of the Pittsburgh Renaissance, as well as Heroic, Concrete Architecture and the New Boston. So truly a specialist on the topic as well. And I'm also very honored to introduce my colleague, Tiffany Lambert, curator at Japan Society. Um, Tiffany has held prior curatorial positions at Columbia University's Arthur Ross Gallery, the Cooper Hewitt, Smithsonian Design Museum, and the Finnish Cultural Institute in New York. Her forthcoming book examines the artistic philosophy of Japanese designer Sori Yanagi, which I can't wait for. Um, but before we turn it over to them, first, I'd like to introduce my colleague, David James, to make a few remarks. He is the president and CEO of Oist Foundation and the chief advancement officer. So please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Well, thank you so much, Ramona, for that very kind introduction. Uh, good evening, and thank you so much to the audience for joining us for tonight's important webinar titled Concrete Paradise, Okinawan Brutalist Architecture. I'm so pleased that the OIST Foundation, Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Foundation is co-organizing a series of webinars uh, with the Japan Society. It's been such a great honor to embark on you, Ramona, and everyone at Japan Society on this. And through the last few months, we've engaged in an exploration of topics such as the blue economy and the impact of climate change on oceans, as well as explored mental health and the mind as it relates to our experiences with COVID. Tonight, we explore architecture in Okinawa, another fascinating subject. Uh, just very briefly, for those who may not know, uh, OIST, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University, uh, located in Onason in the middle of uh, the main island of Okinawa, is an interdisciplinary and international graduate school that offers a five-year PhD in the sciences. We opened our doors 10 years ago and aim to produce groundbreaking research for the benefit of all humankind. 
In 2019, Nature Magazine ranked OIST number one in Japan and number ninth globally for scientific research quality. The OIST Foundation is here in New York. It's a 501c3 nonprofit. And we work very closely, of course, with OIST to support scientific breakthroughs, innovation, and the sustainable development of Okinawa. At OIST, I should say architecture is important, and behind me in my virtual background is a picture of the campus. Architecture inspires and can promote interdisciplinarity and social interaction, which can lead to scientific innovations. At OIST, Kenneth Kornberg and Takashi Okamoto were the chief architects who designed much of our campus, and I hope one day all of you listening will come and visit and see uh, the architecture at OIST campus. But tonight we explore an entirely different type of architecture in Okinawa, so I'm very pleased to turn the floor over to Tiffany Lambert, curator of the Japan Society, uh, and to turn the floor over to all of tonight's speakers. Thank you so much for having me, and thanks for partnering with us. Thank you so much, David. Hello, everyone. I'm Tiffany Lambert, curator at Japan Society. I want to welcome you all and also thank our supporters as well as OIST. Uh, we couldn't imagine a better partner for this series of programs. Um, thank you also to my colleague Ramona for the kind introductions. I would also like to invite all of you to type your questions into the chat um, as they come up while we're talking. We're reserving some time for your questions toward the end of the program. So on with the program. I, I could not be more excited to discuss brutalist architecture in Okinawa and beyond with our two speakers today. There's such a richness to this topic from aesthetic and functional considerations how brutalism really was a worldwide movement that took place, albeit with nuanced ways from country to country. Um, the varied definitions of what brutalism architecture means and has meant across countries and cultures. To contemporary issues such as perspectives on ecology, sustainability, preservation, civic engagement, social planning, and the list goes on. Um, I'm sure we'll get into much of this over the course of our conversation, but I'd like to start from the, the beginning, quote unquote. So when we talk about brutalist architecture, the elements we're generally speaking of are raw concrete and monumental forms. Also this idea of a technological utopia, of progress, um, of a desire for a different, more hopeful future. So I want to put the first question to you, Michael. Um, could you briefly expand on this and maybe discuss the rise of brutalism historically? What were the cultural and social conditions that led to this movement? Sure, yeah, and thanks for having me. Um, it's fascinating to talk about uh, these buildings in Okinawa. Um, so right, as you indicated, brutalism, what came to be known as brutalism uh, as a movement was uh, global. It was, you know, transatlantic in particular, uh, but sort of was happening all around the world, uh, particularly after World War II. Uh, and there were various different points of origin, uh, some of which are more canonical, some of within architectural history, and some of which are less. You know, one of the origin points is uh, in uh, the UK, uh, in England, with uh, Allison and Peter Smithson and a group of architects around them that were advocating for a new kind of honesty and authenticity and kind of commitment to reflecting the raw reality of social and cultural conditions around them, economic conditions. Uh, and the term that they gave to this, what for them was really an ethic more than an aesthetic, uh, was uh, brutalism, a kind of brutal uh, commitment to reality. Uh, there were other architects like Le Corbusier in France that were working in raw concrete, uh, what he called beton brut. Uh, there were, in, in the global sense, uh, there was a heavy interest, uh, especially after the 1950s in, well, let's say there was a real critique of the architectural language and materials that had come to be associated with, let's say, high modernism uh, by the 1940s, which were primarily steel and glass uh, and very thin uh, building systems and skin systems that were, you know, there was a feeling among a lot of architects in very many places that uh, the well had kind of run dry in terms of uh, experimenting with these materials and what you could get out of them. And that it resulted in a language that was kind of thin and didn't have the capacity to be expressive. It was uh, kind of corporatized at that point and was associated with commerce primarily. 
Um, and so there was a lot of interest suddenly in concrete as a material that could uh, sort of get at, for in the case of the Smithsons, this kind of ethical uh, commitment to a kind of a new honesty and authenticity in how architecture was made and what its aesthetic was uh, so that you wouldn't have all sorts of cladding systems and other kind of things that were camouflaging in a way the, the kind of raw material reality of a building that could be structurally, materially, expressively in a single material and concrete offered that kind of possibility. So there was a, there was a real surge of interest uh, around the world in very many places, including Japan quite significantly in the sculptural capacities of this new material, the expressive capacities of this new material, and it was also seen in contrast to things like steel, which is an industrial material that has to be produced in factories and shipped uh, onto the building site. There was a huge interest, um, particularly outside of Europe and the US in concrete as a material that could be produced locally out of local conditions, local craft traditions and technologies uh, as almost a kind of handicraft material uh, at the same time that it was a highly technical material. So it, it came to be the material of choice in very many places in this sort of global movement. Thank you. And then there's the site, of course, of Okinawa, um, which has its own rich history of brutalist buildings um, and traditional as well, which maybe we can talk about later. Um, but I was wondering if both of you or maybe Paul could speak to what has made Okinawa a particularly interesting site for experimenting with this type of architecture. For sure. So as Michael alluded to, um, brutalism really sort of kicked off uh, with the post-war redevelopment um, and Okinawa really suffered the worst of the war. Um, and the, the US military um, construction techniques were really taken on uh, through necessity. Um, a lot of craftsmen were, were lost in the war and concrete presented uh, a cheaper, uh, maybe easier, quicker uh, method uh, way forward. Um, but what's rather interesting is that people are surprised that you know uh, brutalism can be found um, in abundance in uh, Japan and in Okinawa in particular, which is quite ironic in that the Smithsons, as Michael mentioned, uh, they're sort of the progenitors of uh, brutalism and came up with their manifesto. They actually put heavy emphasis on the influence of um, Japanese architectural traditions, um, the rawness of material, honesty of material, formal use of proportion. Um, and I guess here in Okinawa, um, whilst we can look at uh, maybe labels and categories and yeah, the likes of Michael and myself might look at something and go, wow, that's brutalist. A lot of it's actually born of uh, necessity. Um, there's uh, seasonal typhoons. You have to factor in seismic activity. Um, so it's it's more um, rather than bet on brute, I call it bet on necessaire, which I think Michael found amusing, um, but um, probably quite relevant. So I think it's yeah, there are there are very much aesthetic traditions. Um, there's something called uh, I think uh, sukiya, which is using um it's well it's a it's a zen tradition of aesthetics and um and using sort of rough natural elements um so yeah there are there are certain aesthetics that come into it but i would argue that um the the, the reason we see a lot of brutalism here is just uh, simply um through necessity Yeah. Could you talk a little more to, I was curious to unpack that a little bit more about this. Of course, there's the influence um, Japan had on modernism that you mentioned, um, and, and brutalism in particular, too, um, given the relevant nature of that to our conversation, but um, also this problematic portrayal of traditional Japanese architecture and the sort of myth surrounding that. Um, I'm just wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. Yeah, so um, yeah, the Smithsons, like I mentioned, put on uh, put a lot of emphasis on the uh, the influence of Japanese architecture on their um, movement in their manifesto. They it's a short manifesto, but seventy five percent of it, I think, is dedicated to 
the Japanese influence. Um, and this again was, you have to put this in the context of um, post-war UK as well, where previously they had had no um, exposure to Japanese culture. Um, and a lot of architects and designers really picked up on the aesthetic that they were seeing. And this was really kicked off by a film uh, called uh, Gate to Hell. Um, and it was one of the first films done in Eastman Kodak color, and it had a real impact. Um, but there are some critiques of the Smithsons in that really they, they sort of misunderstood Japanese culture themselves and were perhaps victim of mass culture. Well, they, they actually admitted that, but it suited their purposes. They needed a, um, they needed a link um, and brutalism was almost a historical and they actually viewed Japan as a historical as well, as, uh, almost like a, an unchanging culture that didn't, Re, uh, react to uh, changes in politics or culture itself, which is obviously a misunderstanding there. But um, yeah, that interests me as well. The brutalism is totally surrounded with uh, misconception and misunderstanding. So I, I find it quite cool that there is that link between uh, UK brutalism and Japanese brutalism. But um, I think it started with uh, misunderstanding and it, and it continues. Yeah, just to add on to that, I mean, I think that the the notion, the idea that people coming from Europe or, or the US uh, looked, especially in that period, at places like Japan and thought of what regarded what they were seeing as a historical, I think is exactly right. I think that's that's a great way of thinking about their attitude towards you know architecture, architectural traditions in Japan, among many other places in you know, let's say the non-West um, in that framing as like timeless kind of eternal traditions that were very much in, seen by them in contrast to this kind of modern scientific technology, highly technical culture that they associated with, you know, their own places of origin. And so that, and it was, you know, there were very many misunderstandings that came out of this sense of, um, you know, things that would bridge between the one and the other. So there was, you know, Walter Gropius, for example, one of the sort of uh, heroic figures of, um, you know, mainstream modernism, you know, in the 30s and 40s through the, into the 50s uh, that we're talking about was, you know, he wrote a book on Katsura Villa, for example, and was, you know, traveled to Japan in the 1950s among a lot of other architects that were going. Um, and one of the aspects of brutalism and specifically the interest in concrete, which is not always the same as, I mean, brutalism, you know, may, may or may not really refer always to concrete specifically as a material, but one of the bridging points, I think maybe for some of these architects was that concrete uh, expressively, a lot of architects saw it as uh, almost an archaic material, as a material that you could use to construct buildings that would have some of this timeless kind of enduring quality and therefore it was a way almost of tapping into these longer duration histories through a material, a material that didn't look or express itself as a kind of of the moment purely, you know, technical slick uh, kind of corporatized material. And so there was a link uh, on that register in the same way that there was also a link for a lot of architects in terms of construction traditions and craft traditions. So there was a lot of comparison, for example, of uh, Japanese uh, joinery in wood to ways of making beams and you know beam and frame structures in concrete or in other materials that could be kind of crafted in their in their joinery in similar ways or produce similar kinds of expression. So that it's a concrete is a kind of fluid material in its ability to somehow map the difference for these architects between you know, what they were seeing in one culture versus another. Yeah, thank you both for that. Um, if, with any utopian vision comes a dystopic one and there have been negative reactions to brutalism all over the world. I'm thinking particularly of the impacts of concrete as a building material, um, which I think we can expand upon in a bit, but but also there are positive counterpoints to those. Um, and I'm especially thinking of your book, Michael, Heroic, and how you coined this new term um, of heroic to describe these buildings. 
So I was hoping you could both kind of speak to this revaluing of brutalist architecture that's taking place today. Well, I, so I think, I mean, to talk a little bit about the heroic uh, project that was, this was a co-authored book of uh, me, uh, Mark Pasnick and Chris Grimley about specifically concrete buildings in, in Boston, but we were looking at Boston as a case study of this broader um, renewed interest in a style or a set of buildings that you know had 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 been and continue to be misunderstood in a lot of ways. And part of what was really compelling for us was the idealism in was a kind of utopianism. There was a, these buildings and interest in concrete was very future oriented. Uh, it was very much about building a progressive future. And this was often associated with civic buildings and civic space and the provision, you know, provisions for the public realm in a language that would be strong, kind of reassuring, enduring, that would con convey you know, stability and strength you know, in the sense that the public and civic realm would, you know, would continue to be there in time. Um, and nowadays, I mean, we've had to pass through a whole era afterwards in very many places where uh, those intentions were largely forgotten and the buildings came to be seen as uh, overbearing or oppressive or kind of, you know, reflections of, of a kind of overweening state. Uh, and so we were part of a whole generation of people we felt that were going back to the future oriented aspects of these buildings and we're starting to ask questions of you know what happened to that faith in the future uh, at the same time that the the reputation of these buildings had kind of gotten lower and lower and lower you know and was there a capacity to, to reclaim that sort of idealism uh, or that sort of faith in the ability to build a future you know whether utopian or not and so that's why we we wanted to introduce the term heroic to describe those kinds of ideals and to try to get away a little bit from the term brutalism that we felt was kind of skewing the discussion and it had become um, sort of not a useful term anymore for uh, getting a real sense of what that period we, we thought could mean you know, for people today. So I, I would add um, a bit of Japanese context as well. Uh, I guess the, the building behind me can look quite uh, oppressive, uh, this, this topic, but um, architects uh, with concrete found a new way to really express themselves and actually um, promote civic engagement, I think. Um, Post-war Japan, uh, was going through demilitarization, pacification, democratization, decentralization, and um, the, the building of, uh, of these sort of monolithic um, institutional buildings were a, a means to um, promote that process and um, the building of civic halls next to um, city or administrative halls were part of that process. Um, to engage the public. So again, I find it it's quite ironic that we, we often um, associate brutalism with you know, totalitarian states, um, government intrusion, um, whereas maybe that, that cynicism doesn't uh, exist here. Um, and I think maybe what I, what I think brutalism can be a platform for is um, to sort of in investigate what we've lost as citizens um, and the relationship between government and, and people. Um, and I think brutalism puts up some sort of surprising um, links between things like planning, civic engagement, social planning, and probably most ironically of all, um, sustainability, as you mentioned, Tiffany. Um, there are many arguments um, against uh, concrete use. Um, the simple fact here in Okinawa is that it's available. Uh, yes, there are carbon emissions and heavy water use. Um, but I think if we really sort of investigate uh, some of the um, methods forward, um, 
could be reuse, actually preservation. Uh, I think brutalism really piques our interest in preservation. Um, tastes shouldn't um, take over from sort of sensible decision making. Um, and I think whilst there's some uh, elements of greenwashing that can go on, I don't know if, uh, Aki, please, if you can go to um, slide 16. that coming up what i want to uh, show is um over greening of balconies and things like that but um actually concrete um provides through its strength um a, a means to provide um proper um urban farming um urban uh, greening um thermal regulation um, just because of its sort of strong uh, load bearing abilities uh, so yeah, it's uh, slide 16 there, Aki. If you can, this this is the inside of um, Nago's uh, Civic Hall. That's very much um, got some sort of quintessential brutalist looks there. Um, the difference in Okinawa is that they they incorporate a lot of um, traditional aspects, uh, attempts at critical regionalism. Um, but yeah, I think. Uh, Brutalism can be a, a platform to really investigate, um, like I say, a lot of issues of sustainability um, through to uh, fear in planning. Um, so it's I, I'm, I'm intrigued as to the interest in it. I can't quite put my finger on why there's an in increase in the interest. It might be that a, you know, um, a brutalist building doesn't look out of place in a Star Wars film. Um, but uh, I think beyond aesthetics, um, and like Michael was mentioning, uh, is it is it ethic or aesthetics? I, I think brutalism really can um, make us uh, question our own ethics um, and way forward. Uh, oh, this is uh, this as you can see now. This is my favourite building in uh, in Okinawa. Um, probably don't see anything like that outside of Okinawa. And probably designed there to withstand a typhoon, might face a prevailing wind. I'm not sure. <laughs> but the function of this one, can you can you tell us what that is? Because I think a lot of people may be surprised. Or what the building's used for. Ah, for sure. So again, I, I guess in the West we might associate um, brutalism with derelict and uh, abandoned buildings, um, but here they're really they're fully utilised. Uh, functional, um, loved uh, in a way, um, but whilst we do have the, the civic institutions uh, uh, like we find in the West, we also, also find um, hair salons, um, florists, um, many schools as well, um, and even private residences. Um, and uh, the, 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 the image now actually, that's, um, that's a, an elderly care centre. Um, with uh, residences above. Uh, so this is the greenwashing that we might see. Um, this isn't actually greenwashing. It's not really caring about what your neighbours think. Um, but uh, I think the next slide will show what I was talking about. In, like, here we go. Um, using, using the strength of these uh, buildings. And I really don't understand this idea of knocking, knocking them down. You've got to consider the, the energy that went into them. It seems hypocritical or counterproductive i'm not sure but i think we can really use these um the existing buildings um in a sustainable way um so that's just uh demonstrating some sort of green roofing there and a big issue in okinawa environmentally is runoff uh we have pl pineapple plantations that um during heavy rain uh that red soil is ru run off from these fields Prior to that, it was sugarcane and that bound the soil up. Now the soil just runs off, um, very rapidly gets to the sea and uh, um, quickly destroys the coral. So uh, it's my idea that some of these uh, load bearing structures could um, actually um, act to sort of, uh, reduce uh, runoff, or at least um, um, stall it and prevent the, uh, the, some coral destruction. So this, by the way, this is another aspect of these buildings that I think connects to lots of things that are going on in, in other places at the same, in the same 
period, you know, there was a lot of interest in concrete, you know, all over in as a, if you like, almost as an infrastructural material, as a, as a material through which you could make frameworks for things that could grow and evolve and be developed uh, as a kind of robust armature for things that would kind of take place in the future. So there's a lot of discussion. This is where concrete, for example, intersects uh, very heavily with the metabolist uh, architectural movement in, in Japan uh, after the, the 50s and 60s, uh, where which was all about making these kind of system buildings or you know what, were, what came to be called mega structures um, by and large, uh, very often and typically in concrete of a kind of framework that could be added onto and could uh, take things very well, like greenery or you know uh, the architects of Boston City Hall, for example described the building when they were designing it as a, a, a robust armature for continued adornment by the citizens as it would be so that it would become a kind of living active uh, kind of center of the democratic you know state composed of its citizens and so it's materially a lot of the issues nowadays i mean it's these buildings are a challenge. They're 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 kind of a challenge. You know, their duration, their sort of temporal, let's say, endurance, and their kind of stubbornness, in a lot of cases, presents a challenge. Um, partly for these specific technical reasons, but also because they, you know, they're they were designed to be to perform and to kind of express themselves as these robust enduring armatures and to look as if they would just survive forever but of course it's like any other material they require maintenance they they need care so it's it's a kind of a you know fake out a little bit as a material sometimes that that uh, a lot of these buildings uh, maybe not in the case of these buildings in Okinawa that are robustly used but in a lot of other places there's a whole legacy of buildings that have not been maintained and have been allowed to decay over time uh, and i think part of that is to do with the sense that you know it's as if the material didn't need to be maintained when in fact it does like wood or like steel or like any other material so there's a, it's it's a challenge in in very many ways in terms of kind of how they sit with us in the present as something that was kind of future oriented but now is quite old buildings that were meant to look like uh, they would endure in time and to kind of have that expression but which require care uh, at the, and the other piece of, to connect to the, what Paul was saying about sustainability, um, it is not necessarily in the Japanese context, but in certainly in the US context, uh, there was a heavy association of a lot of these concrete buildings of that time period, specifically in the 1960s, with the demolition of things that came before. This was associated with urban renewal, urban planning, uh, uh, development programs in the, in the US and lots of other places. And so the buildings are also a challenge to think about in sustainability terms now, you know, where I think there's a strong argument, aside from all the other arguments, there's a strong argument for keeping and maintaining and kind of reviving interest in, in uh, these sites, partly to not repeat the same mistakes that you know, cause the negative critique of a lot of these buildings in the in the beginning, which is to say that in order to build them, they required the demolition of a lot of historic architecture that came before. To do that again would be the least sustainable and the, and the most problematic thing I think that we could do. I think what's quite refreshing though, uh, Michael, is the fact that the, the last year's uh, Pritzker Prize, um, I forget the name, it's another husband and wife couple like the Smithsons, but um, they're their ethic is um, preserve and and do you know do very li little with a building beyond a bit of maintenance and uh, a touch of renovation and that that's really that you know that I think that um, provides a lot of hope for the preservation of um, uh, brutalist buildings across the world. Yeah, and this is where I mean it's for me it's really aside from the you know my interest architecturally in, in the buildings that you photographed it's it's also really exciting for me to see them and learn more about them because it seems like to the extent that a lot of them seem as you say to be really robustly used they're still regarded well they're still civic centers they're you know they they provide for 
citizens to kind of enjoy them in a in a way that has continued over time. And in that sense, they they really seem like a very positive example of a lot of things that we've had to argue for the possibility of, sure. you know, things that are could be possible if people conceive the buildings that way in yeah. other contexts. But here you have examples where that really is taking place. And I think it, you know, these examples can help undercut the arguments that a lot of people make uh, in other places that uh, you know, concrete is inherently ugly, or it's inherently unsustainable, or it you know cannot be loved, and you know, all of these kind of um, arguments as if there's no alternative in how we think of them. You know, I think now we could just point them to these you know these sites and these buildings, and the people who love them and use them and think well of them, and sort of say, well, you know, here's your counterexample. For sure. I, I, I guess my hope is that with um, understanding um, comes appreciation. Uh, I, I think a lot of a lot of the um, perceptions are based on misunderstanding, um, and also you know taste as well. You might you, know, you might not really like something, but if you if you begin to understand it, it may well even change your taste and change your own aesthetics. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean that was that was why we we wrote the book. You know, and I think I, to get back to Tiffany to your your question about, you know, what is causing the the revival of interest in a lot of places where they've the buildings have had to go through this kind of fallow period of, you know, the low point of taste or reception, and now they're those feelings are changing. You know, I, I think part of it is a generational change. Uh, we've written a lot about the way that tastes change over time, style, you know, perception and reception of style. And taste changes over time and a lot of it is generational in the same way that you know something that is loathed you know the generation after is then the generation after that becomes vintage and becomes you know the subject of nostalgia and and uh at paul as you say appreciation right so it's you know learning and appreciation and kind of coming to see the value of these things i think is very often the key you know to um to being able to preserve them and to be able to think of different futures of them. So I think it's very, you know, seeing buildings like the ones that you photographed and seeing in a way different lived realities in different places of how people, you know, that there aren't, it's not monolithic. It's not, there's not one way to feel about these buildings or places. You know, there are many different attitudes and many of them are positive and, and you know, we do need to kind of learn from those uh, experiences. Yeah, it's funny. I I grew up um, through a generation where, uh, yeah, I guess for the seventies, eighties, nineties, there was quite a, a, a backlash. Um, and Prince Charles didn't help by saying the National Theatre was you know, an excuse yeah. for a nuclear bunker. Right, um, a he's done he's done a lot of great work, but he, it, he really it, undermined brutalism yeah. there. <laughs> but said it was a me, monstrous carbuncle on the face of a much loved friend. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Um, and so it's very generational when tastes do change. And I, I again, what a refreshing thing for me is that um, I'm getting a lot of response through my feed from um, gamers, and not all gamers are young, but I think um, you know most of them, most of them would be of a younger generation, and they don't have these negative associations. Um, so that provides a bit of hope too. Yeah, thank you both. That covered actually a few questions that I wanted to ask about shifting perceptions and, um, you know, more than just the uncompromising way of building, um, getting at more of brutalism's functionality as well and potential. But I wanted to also ask you both, um, you also touched upon this idea that many brutalist buildings are, they were they are or were cultural um, or municipal in nature, right? So building upon this idea of brutalism as an ethic, which you also have brought up, you know, some people have argued that it's a vernacular that um, really expressed a certain kind of socialism or different kinds of socialisms or the welfare state, um, which is this really interesting idea because you have the world's most avant-garde architects at this time in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, building our public libraries, they're building our city halls, they're building our schools and public housing. And I wanted to just have you unpack that a little bit more, if you could. Is there still potential in this idea today, do you think? 
I think there is potential, but it, I mean, it's, it's what you're saying is certainly true that um, there was, I mean, we have to account for the ways that concrete, I mean, building programs in general in a lot of cities, you know, uh, certainly in the US and Europe and Japan and other places, uh, but also the interest in concrete as the material of choice for these kinds of buildings was very, very heavily related to the welfare state. Essentially, it was this was this 1960s was uh, as close as we've ever come to a robust welfare state in the U.S. Uh, it was certainly the case in the U.K. Uh, and and there was part of the interest in concrete was as a, a material through which you could express a certain kind of power of you know, especially through civic buildings, right? That they would convey strength, power, um, you know, luxury in a lot of cases of the what was being provided, you know, for the citizenry. And that, that what corresponded to it was a faith in government, a faith in the civic realm that was kind of broadly shared across a large segment of the population. And part of, again of this cycle of um, negativity that now maybe can be sort of flipped again uh, is a, was is a real loss of faith in government in in certainly in the U.S. you know and in um, you know many countries in Europe and again there it's interesting to talk about the differences in the Japanese con the similarities or the differences in the Japanese context. I mean we we were writing primarily about the U.S. where um, the loss of faith in government was you know fundamental for the dislike of these buildings past a certain point because they, the, the impression that they made came to be associated with extravagance, with kind of excessive cost or with waste or with a kind of overbearing nature of government that people wanted to get out of their lives, right? And so I think part of the revival of uh, interest is also tied to a broader, you know, I mean, the, the broader efforts to re kind of revitalize faith in the not just in the civic realm but faith in the notion of society you know rather than a kind of in, you know uh, atomized individualism uh, and that that's part and parcel of the environment in which these buildings were conceived and you know which hopefully is possible again i think the um the, it's getting some questions through now um I don't know if you'd like me to address some of the questions we're seeing through. But just yeah, I'll like, I'll select some in a few minutes. Sure. But if you want to, if you have anything to say about that, or in, yeah, know, just to, comment to, to what Michael said for yeah. sure. Yeah, um, I, I think again, yeah, there's, there's this uh, link in the West between brutalism and uh, centralization, maybe, and um, an overbearing government. I think the the difference. Um, it, it, the Japanese experience um, centers on the fact that these institutional buildings, um, well, firstly, they were there as a, um, an economic boost, um, part of redevelopment as well, um, but also very, um, very much aimed at um, building a, a, a local sense of identity. So what, what may differ between Western and um, Japanese brutalism it's probably the it's the incorporation of um, local aspects in the um, in the architecture so we would talk about brutalism being a historical and and maybe non-place specific as well in sort of quite an international aesthetic whereas what you'll see like for example behind me um, it, it, it's actually in mimicry of a, a local castle uh, construction and what the, the holes there uh, are in mimicry of um, breeze blocks, which is very much um, central to architecture in Okinawa um, because it provides um, ventilation. And also, if you if you build a sheer wall in concrete, it can actually act more like a sail and and not um, stand up too well to a typhoon. So, what Michael was talking about um, in terms of um, yeah, uh, faith in uh, in government. I think in the West we 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 maybe associate brutalism with centralized state, whereas here the the brutalism is a, is is maybe more symptomatic of a decentralized state um, and it incorporates 
local features and allows for more of local sense of identity, which you, to be honest, you don't see um, elsewhere. Yeah, so just to, uh, I guess now, I mean, just to jump in on some of the questions that I'm seeing in the chat, I know rather, I know you're gonna select them, but just because they, they relate, I think really well to what Paul was just saying. So there, you know, the, the last two questions that I'm seeing, one is, is brutalism something unique in Okinawa or are we talking about influences from places like the UK, the US or Germany? I think, you know, what, um, you know, just to reinforce what Paul is saying, I think the, 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 the kinds of brutalism that you see in these buildings in Okinawa are going to be specific to that context. You know, those, the, the local, let's say local traditions of construction, local, you know, building technologies uh, and traditions to particular references like the castle, for example, or, um, you know, they will be specific to their place in the way that, that concrete buildings in a lot of places, even though they shared broadly, you know, characteristics that make them relatable across contexts, you will get very specific brutalisms, I would say, in different sort of places. And then there is also a question about uh, bunkers and fortifications, right? Is there a relationship, uh, particularly in Japan, I would think, right, to the, the war time context. Uh, and the answer to that is yes, absolutely. Uh, I would think, I would imagine in these buildings, and right, it's not incidental that the, the building and you know, Paul's background is it also evokes, right, if a, you know, castles or other periods of massive, heavy construction that are often related to things like bunkers or fortifications. Uh, and that was certainly, that was the case also in Europe, for example, when um, architects like um, Paul Virilio and Claude Parent uh, were building in concrete in France in the 60s, they were absolutely fascinated by uh, the bunkers that lined the coast of France, uh, you know, from World War II, these, these, you know, massive concrete, kind of quite monolithic, you know, uh, sort of amazing structures. So there's, there are a lot of things like that, that I think are, are certainly feeding into the thinking of architects that are working uh, in Japan. And then lots of other places in the in the nineteen fifties and the nineteen sixties. Yeah, I was Tiffany, thinking of I... bunker ar archaeology is the <laughs> in relation to that. Um, I did have a question too that relates to uh, partly what somebody is asking as well. Um, so we're seeing some really great questions coming through, um, which is. Um, you know, what influences do you see brutalism having on contemporary architecture, especially in Okinawa, where approximately 90% of new buildings are made out of concrete as a material? Yeah, there's, um, there's uh, certainly a lot of um, bespoke uh, new brutalism um, happening. Um, Though I must say, it's often a way of um, demonstrating your wealth. It's uh, it's 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 not um, it's not a cheap thing these days, um, and there's some pretty nice uh, combinations of uh, concrete and uh, timber. Um, and I, I guess at this juncture, I'd like to point out br brutalism doesn't necessitate it being made out of uh, concrete. I think Michael will agree with that, but. Um, yeah, I, I guess through necessity and availability, 90% um, of the buildings I see around me are made from concrete. That comes from uh, there being uh, the, the big mine just 10 minutes up the road from, from me. Um, there's uh, access to um, riverbed aggregate. You need fine coarse sand for binding. So there's, there's plenty of that around. Um, and also it's, uh, there's, yeah, I guess there's just experience um, in, in, uh, in making, um, in, in constructing with concrete. Uh, and I can't see it going away anytime soon. Um, but the, the, the bigger apartment blocks could tend to be a bit nondescript, but the, as you might sort of see through the, the slideshow, there's some really um, funky iterations going on and a bit more bespoke um again i'm not sure if the the owners or the people that view them here would refer to them as brutalism they're just so used to seeing uh, concrete i think it's a fascination to um outsiders uh, more than uh, the locals who maybe take it for granted but that, that may change too 
So the, the, I mean, that statistic is, you know, 90% of buildings are still being built in concrete. I think points a little bit to the sustainability, the, the problematics of sustainability in relation to concrete in, in general. You know, there are things that might seem a little bit contradictory, right? That it's, it's you know, I think there's a huge sustainability environmental argument to be made for keeping and maintaining and revaluing a lot of buildings that were built previously, right? That are there, that have a huge amount of embodied energy that required an you know, enormous amount of matter and labor to build and that, uh, you know, you don't wanna to have to redo all of that. At the same time that there are a lot of serious problems with the notion that, um, you know, lots of things continue to be built in concrete given what we know about how kind of environmentally problematic it is as a material. It is an incredibly resource, you know, material and kind of ecological resource consuming material it requires a huge amount of water, it requires uh, mining extraction. It's an extraction based material. So you have to mine the sand. There's a kind of global crisis of, you know, sand mining uh, in order to supply the materials that are needed for the amount of concrete construction in a lot of places. So there's, the, again, it's another way that concrete is a is a really contradictory material that, you know, you can at the same time make sustainability arguments for keeping a lot of things that already exist in concrete and are valuable at the same time that I think, you know, it's, it, it is a sort of tricky question of like, should things continue to be built in large quantities, let's say in concrete or, or you know, do we have, I mean, do we have to rethink that in some fashion, I guess. Yeah, think, so, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, that, that, those issues will touch on Okinawa. One of the questions is, uh, are, are um, municipal buildings still um, building heavily in concrete? Yes, they, they are. Um, again, probably through necessi necessity and availability. Though one of my assumptions is being tested, you know, I got here and water, I was walking around Hang on, my word! You got all these uh, brutalist buildings that would probably be under threat um, in the UK or the states, or there'd be some argument as to whether they should be still standing or not. Um, but much to my upset, there are a um, couple of buildings that, that stand out that are up for possible uh, demolition, and both are really unique. Um, it, one is the uh, Nago uh, uh, city building, uh, sort of a, an administrative centre, and the other one is Naha down in the capital, which is the civic hall. Um, and quite, quite possibly, the only thing saving it is the fact that um, it actually um, was the the um, site where the return of Okinawa to Japan was celebrated. I think David mentioned that at the very beginning of the speech. Uh, the 50 year um, anniversary. Um, it actually failed a seismic um, audit, um, which, is, which was a justification for pulling it down. But it's been some years now, I think it was, if that was 15, 20 years ago, but the fact that they've released uh, on the news lately the, the, the project to do a, a 3D virtual walkthrough um, of the Civic Hall suggests to me that it might not be uh, standing much longer. Yeah, there's a question um, from someone which is interesting. So we talked a little bit about this preservation and the sustainability um, argument for keeping buildings as, as they already exist and the sort of cost benefits of that. But someone has a question about whether or not um, existing brutalist buildings can be refurbished to make them more sustainable or eco-friendly. And if so, how is that? How would that be done? I mean, yes, the answer is yeah, abs absolutely. And in a lot of cases, um, the, the qualities of the original construction are kind of work well in favor of the buildings continuing to evolve and uh, that they can be reused in, in you know, fairly innovative ways by which I mean that the, the, the strength of the structure and the capacity of a concrete structure, let's say a poured in place concrete structure 
to accommodate all sorts of other things is typically pretty pretty good. You can you can add things onto it. It can take you know often structures can take more construction on top of them so that you don't have to build a completely new building. Um, but you you know you there are lots of uh, ways that architects are trying to really good nice examples to very sensitively kind of start with what you have and work within it and kind of build onto it. I think Paul mentioned uh, La Caton Basel, the, the Pritzker Prize winners who've done a number of projects involving concrete structures, not necessarily brutalist, let's say stylistically, um, with very sensitive ways of kind of editing and, and you know, adding on and all of these things. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of, let's say, continuing durability in the matter itself that I think can really serve as a good scaffolding for architects that are sensitive about how to how to work with these things, how to how to kind of edit and, and work with the existing rather than thinking you always have to demolish and it's easier, you know, or cheaper to build a new building from scratch. I, I think uh, Michael, you'll know um, also about um, thermal regulation and um, sort of changing sort of the insulation techniques. Uh, there's an architect uh, in Tokyo called Kotara Ide, and he's uh, very much into the aesthetic of uh, concrete, but you know, he admits um, some of its uh, thermal regulation qualities aren't always the best, depending on the climate you're in. So he's uh, into providing an outer shell of concrete, um, just for, for the, the beauty of the concrete and the the appeal of sort of new brutalism. This is a contemporary architect. He's 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 working now. Um, very busy guy. He's, he's, so his work's popular. But he um, he makes up for the the poor thermal regulation through using uh, more sustainable insulation materials. I mean, there are and there are insulation materials that are equally bad for the environment. Um, but that's that's another technique is really sort of thinking about how you go about um, the, the the internal regulation um, of these buildings, um, and also the the, the 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 urban farming and the uh, the use of um, uh, green or roof topping that that actually plays into um, uh, regulation as well of the the internal environment of the building. Um, so there are steps there as well. And then also in terms of carrying on building in, in concrete, not just um, preserving existing structures, but using uh, concrete in the future, there, there are um, a, a lot of experiment, uh, experiments and um, work into um, using recycled material, different compacting uh, methods. There's a university in the UK, UK that is uh, pioneering the use of rubber um in uh, in concrete so i think there is there is an awareness of the the environmental costs of concrete um but then yeah because of its positives as well and um actually you can use less material with concrete and cover huge expanses um you know which um, in using other materials you, you know you, there would be a lot more uh, volume as well say in timber or steel and glass so yeah, there are there is there is um, interest in more sustainable use of concrete um, as a material. Yeah, that's so. Some of you know one of the things that was uh, the most appealing, you know, when in the, the era when people were building the most heavily in concrete, was that it would it could be really an all in one sort of material, right? You could run. I mean, it was both structure and finish and uh, you could run services through it. It would kind of, you know, it kind of did all of the jobs, right? You didn't need separate materials, separate material systems, connectors, and you know, gaskets, and you know, all, you didn't need all of the stuff. Uh, you could kind of strip everything down to this all-in-one kind of material, and that's what conveyed, you know, the sense of an honest kind of authentic material that kind of it was itself, and you didn't need more stuff. And so I think you're absolutely right that it's there are ways if we're prepared to treat it that way and think about it that way there are lots of ways that concrete you know when used well and intelligently can be 
a much more efficient material, much more efficient structurally, much more efficient in spanning, much more efficient in doing a lot of jobs that can really cut down on the use of all of this other excessive stuff kind of materially, technically speaking. And so again, there are a lot of qualities, also thermal mass, right? The, the, the clever use of thermal mass as, as a conditioning, you know, it, can, it can sort of do a lot of the conditioning work for interiors if it's kind of treated properly. Uh, so that I think that there's there's a sense that if you know we worked with the positive qualities of material, that there is a lot that it can do um, that that now suddenly seems very useful in sustainability terms. Sure. And what building materials come without their own environmental costs? You know, this steel, glass, timber. Yeah, there are arguments for maybe maybe sustainable forestry, um, but you know, every material. Um, apart from maybe compacted snow, yeah, um, ha ha has its um, has its environmental cost. I even have its own as well. <laughs> um, so <laughs> that's sort of really full circle, just back to the beginning when I was mentioning how rich this topic really, really is. There's and, and how much promise it has, and and I think why it continues to be such an interesting theme for people or typology of buildings that people get interested in. But even though there are a million more really interesting questions that we could certainly get into, it is, um, it is time for us to end things. Um, so I want to just thank you once more. Um, Michael and Paul are wonderful speakers um, and to you all for attending this program. Many thanks uh, also to OIST and to the entire Japan Society team that worked on making this event possible. We always appreciate your feedback. If you have a brief moment, please be sure to fill out our short survey about the program. You can find the survey at the link uh, in the YouTube chat. We hope you'll join us for future programs. More information about all of those can be found on our website, japansociety.org. And I also just wanted to quickly say this event is part of our very special year-long um, Okinawa in Focus initiative, which explores this fascinating archipelago in depth. Additional events related to Okinawa and beyond can be found on our website as well. So please head there, check it out. We look forward to you joining us soon. Thank you again, everyone. Take care. Thanks everyone.